Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to our devotionals in the book of Zechariah, the gospel according to Zechariah. This morning we're in Zechariah chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. So if you do have your Bibles, uh, be sure to follow along with me. Uh, I'm going to read now from, as I say, Zechariah chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. It says this, Then I looked up and saw four animal horns. What are these? I asked the angel who was talking with me. He replied, These horns represent the nations that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four blacksmiths. What are these men coming to do? I asked. The angel replied, These four horns, these nations scattered and humbled Judah. Now these blacksmiths have come to terrify those nations and to throw them down and destroy them. Now, throughout Zechariah, as we've already seen, and will continue to see, there are visions that seem strange and confusing sometimes. But often, they are explained for us, at least partially, by the angel that's with Zechariah. Not so with this vision. In fact, when me and Andy were planning to do this devotional series, I actually said, let's skip over uh, this vision, because it's bizarre, especially in more literal translations, it can be very hard to understand what's actually going on here. What's going on with these blacksmiths and these horns? It seems quite strange. But I actually think there's something really quite precious in here for us to see. So I hope that as we unpack this, we see the, the um, comfort this offers us in our lives. So, so what does this mean? What is this vision of these four horns and this blacksmith uh, and these blacksmiths? What does that mean to us? Well, the horn is is a symbol that's used really throughout the Old Testament and even into the New Testament. We find it in one Samuel, for instance, in many of the Psalms, and in in Luke, in Mary's song, for instance. The horn is a symbol of strength, of power. You have to bear in mind that ancient Israel is a very agricultural uh, culture. And so when the thinking of symbols of power, symbols um, that, that demonstrate what power looks like in action, you know, they look into the field and they see the animals that have the most uh, domination really over the others are the ones with the biggest horns. They're the ones that have the most power, the most authority. And so the horn starts being used as a symbol for power, for authority. I mean, think about a hunter's wool, for instance. He doesn't put the most mild-looking animals on the wall. He demonstrates his authority over the animals he's killed by displaying the ones with the biggest horns. You know, I have authority even over this animal with horns bigger than me. So throughout the Bible, as I say, the horn is a symbol of power, of authority. And it's being used here... Uh, as a way of describing uh, this, the enemies, the enemies that are coming up against uh, God's people, the enemies of power and authority that are coming to them on every side. Now, there has been a question, for instance, because it says these four horns represent the nations that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Some commentators have taken each of the four horns to represent an individual nation. So four horns is four nations. And that could be the case in places like Daniel, for instance, where in Daniel 7 there is a vision of horns. They certainly do correspond to individual nations. But is that, what, is that what's going on here? Seems more likely to me that the four horns are not supposed to be seen as four individual nations. But if you think about Israel, uh, as uh, how they're feeling, how they're considering themselves, it feels as though they have enemies on every side. They have enemies to the north, to the east, to the south, and to the west. And so it's like there are four horns all around them. Every side they look, there's a horn up against them. There's this, this powerful authority that's out to get them. There's an enemy that is pressing in on them. Certainly if you read books like Nehemiah and Ezra and, and Haggai, around the same time as Zechariah, or at least in the same situation, the feeling for them very much is, we're surrounded by enemies on every side. There's four horns around us. And so I think it's best that we don't take these four horns as representing individual nations, but representing the feeling that on every side is someone out to get us. 
And then the vision continues. We see these, these four enemies, these, these four powers. But then it says, the Lord showed me four blacksmiths. What are these men coming to do, Zechariah asks. And the, and the angel replies, these four horns, these nations scattered and humbled uh, Judah, but these blacksmiths have come to terrify those nations and to throw them down and destroy them. What is the image of the blacksmith doing here? When you think about a blacksmith, what do you think of? For me, for me I think of that the sound of the hammer hitting the anvil, the, the sound of iron hitting iron, the power that is being that you can hear reverberating through that action. And it seems that what's happening here is that these blacksmiths are being introduced to stop these horns in their tracks. You know, uh, a horn has this power, it's ramming at you. But as soon as you put a horn on an anvil and bring the hammer down on it, it turns to powder. And suddenly something that seemed scary, something which had power to destroy you, is now merely powder. What was once power is now mere powder. That's what these blacksmiths have come to do, to render these powers void, to render the powers powerless. The enemies that are against God's people has been stopped. And so when we're reading this message for, for Zechariah, for instance, in its immediate context, it's a message of comfort to God's people. It feels as though there are enemies around you on every side, but what this vision is showing you is don't worry because God has established means. He's established ways of stopping them in their tracks, of destroying these horns that are rising up against you. And so naturally, when we're reading this, you know, 2,500 years later, should we be saying, well, we're not in the same position, so it means nothing to us? No, far be it from that. The whole of chapter one of Zechariah really could be summed up in this phrase, the Lord loves his people. And it's expressing that in an immediate context, in the context of Jerusalem being rebuilt. But that doesn't become untrue as soon as time starts to move on. The Lord still loves his people. Though there's lots of different themes that come through in Zechariah 1, you could really uh, say that uh, it's about the Lord wanting his people to repent and return to him. It's about the Lord's desire to restore his people. It's about the Lord's desire to bless and prosper his people. It's about the Lord's desire to defend and protect his people. What does that all come under the category of? As I say, the Lord loves his people. And so, just like with the rest of the chapter, what this is saying to us is the Lord still desires to defend and protect and bless us. To protect his people, Israel. And so, when enemies in our lives come forward, when horns are around us on every side, the Lord has established blacksmiths to render their power void. The New Testament talks about the enemies that attack the Christian. It says that there are the world, the flesh, and the devil. You know, the, the influences outside of us that seek to turn us away from God. The uh, sinful desires that live inside of us that make us feel as though we are our own worst enemy. Think about places like Romans 7, where Paul basically sees the battle uh, as a battle against himself. I, don't, I do what I don't want to do. The sinful flesh inside me still exerts this influence over me. And lastly, the, the devil, the one whose greatest desire is to see me taken away from God, to see me accused before him, to see me condemned. And so the, the New Testament presents these enemies as the enemies that are always against the Christian. What does Zechariah 1 have to say to us in this matter? It says this, there are enemies on every side. There are horns, four horns on every corner, but there are four blacksmiths. And you see what's happening there? For every horn, there's a blacksmith. For every uh, power that's being raised against us, there is something that can render it null and void. For everything that seeks to attack the Christian, and attack God's church, God has established a remedy to solve it. He has given us his word to know his promises. He's given us his own spirit to fill us with his presence and sanctify us. He's given us 
precious and very great promises like 2 Peter 1 talks about in order to give us hope for the future. The Lord has established his church to build us up and to keep us accountable to other believers. The message is this, there is a horn on every side of the Christian's life. But with every horn, there is a blacksmith. And if we grab onto God by faith, if we take, make the most of those remedies that he's given us, those powers can be turned to powder. That's the message that this vision is really giving us. The, black, the horns do not have the power that they look like they have. Because when the hammer comes down and hits the anvil, there's no horn left over. There's no horn left over. There's no more damage it can do. And so the challenge for us as believers is to take hold of those remedies that God has given us. To take hold of God's word, to be in prayer, in, in uh, seeking God in prayer, to be involved in the church, to be surrounded by other people who know and love the Lord and encourage us in our walk with him. By faith, we need to lay hold of the promises that God has given us so that those horns may be dealt with by the blacksmiths that God has established. So despite the fact that this can seem like quite a, a confusing prophecy, I do hope that this blesses us and this challenges us and it encourages us because it is for us. It's, it's promises of comfort for us. This is good news that we find here in Zechariah 1. So a question to take with you through your day and, and through the rest of your Christian life really is what can you be doing to, by faith, take hold of the blacksmiths God has established to render the horns that come against you as null, to turn them into mere powder. So I'll leave you with that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that though four horns rise up against us on every side and seek to take us down, you have established four blacksmiths. Lord, you have established a blacksmith for every horn, a remedy for every problem. So Lord, we pray that you teach us to, to lay hold of those remedies by faith, to put our faith in the one who uh, loves us and seeks to protect us, defend us, to bless us and prosper us, to restore us, to make us your people. Encourage us from your word, we pray, Lord. Amen. Well, thanks very much for joining me, guys, and I'll see you next week. Bye.